Well, I, I certainly echo the first speaker in saying that this is a, a just impossible task. Uh, looking two years ahead in bioinformatics is almost impossible, but 20 years is quite mind-blowing. And so uh, it, it, I've had a difficult few days worrying about what I was going to say here. So anyway, I'll, I'll do what I can. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, start with, with a little bit of crystal ball gazing and try and put myself in the year 2020 and, and think where we might be. Then I'll say something about the computing hardware infrastructure and how that might develop. Then I'll talk about, very briefly, the, the sort of grand scientific challenges that, that I see that computational biology can contribute to. And lastly, I'll come back to a, a more sort of short-term goal of what we need to do to achieve those grand challenges in the long ter longer term. So the first part, of course, in bioinformatics is the data, which all of you have been busy collecting very busily for us to look at, which is very nice. And um, I think we can think about the data much as we think about language. Uh, we've got the parts dictionary, dictionaries, the, the bits that go up to, to make it, the, the thesaurus that tells you how these different parts um, relate to one another in some sense, the annotation, it tells you what the, what the bits mean and which are, the, which are proteins that have the same structure or genes that have the same, same function, the paralogs and the orthologs. Then we, we could have the, the plays, the sort of infinite variety of networks, the combinatorics that we heard about before. Of course, we've got to have atlases that tell us where the proteins and the genes express, where in the body of whichever model organism we're looking at. So we need to have those atlases. We obviously need to know what goes wrong and how, how these, all of these parts relate to what happens if something goes wrong with, with the body. Um, and we also need databases of how we put those bits right, just as in a, a gardening book you have, these are the pests and these are the things that you have to spray on the, the plants to, to solve them. We need all of those, th that sort of information in, in, in databases. We also clearly then, that's, that's all generic for the whole sort of population, but we also need then the individual, the, the information on the individuals, not possibly first as, as sort of representatives, but I suspect by, by 2020, we'll be talking about lots of individual data on, on individual people. So by 2020, I think that the parts dictionaries will be more or less complete. We'll have the key genomes, we'll have most of the SNPs on those, and most of the promoters and regulators, I think, will be identified on those genomes. We'll have, annotated, well, we'll have found all the genes, I hope, by then. Um, and, and got them all annotated. We'll know what the proteins are, including all the splice variants that come out of them. We'll have structures, certainly, I think, for most of the domains, perhaps not quite all of them. Some of them may be very difficult to get. And we'll have structures of some of the complexes. Again, probably not. We saw some of the complexes this morning, the, the transcription factor complexes. Those are going to be very difficult. And again, the combinatorics, inflates the number of, of structures that you need. But it, in terms of the basic structures, I think we'll have most of those sorted out. And I think we'll know most of the small molecule composition of the cells that we're looking at. So all of those parts we'll have to play with. That will, will be the basic thing. The next stage, of course, is, well, oh no, not, I'm not on to the next stage yet. So let's just look. I thought just as an exercise, we would, um, you know, look at where, how we should project these, and I'm sure you've all done, done this sort of thing, where we are, the year, and the, um, and the amount of data. So this is the cumulative number of sequence pairs in GenBank. And of course, it's gone up immensely quick, quickly over the last uh, two years. And if one extrapolates that to 2020, you can see there's a huge, depending on how you extrapolate, <laughs> there's a huge variation in what you might end up with. <laughs> uh, so you can end up with about 10 to the 15 base pairs, or you can end up with about 10 to the 21 base pairs. The total number of human base pairs, if everyone on the planet was sequenced, is that uh, red triangle um, square in the corner there. So potentially, by 2020, we could have complete sequences of everybody on the planet if we wanted them. And I'm, I'm sure this isn't the way that that, that, that will happen, but nevertheless, uh, I think that we can certainly, if we just look for variations, we may well be, be able to have something 
like that available to us. From the structures, the structures have actually gone up much more slowly. So at the moment, probably this is three-dimensional structures. We have about 16,000 structures in the PDB. And again, one can ex extrapolate. And again, it depends how you do it. But we end up with about 10 to 100,000 protein structures, which is a lot less than probably we will need. Now, again, this depends. We did try to factor in. You can see there's a little blip in about 2005, and that was supposed to be the tr structural genomics projects with their current estimate. Uh, of, and, and that little blip doesn't do very much for us, actually, <laughs> as you will see. Um, but I think that as with the genome sequences, we really, uh, Francis showed very nicely yesterday how, in fact, we achieved much more than we thought. I, I hope that the same will be true of the, of the structures. But it's very different in the structural world because the technology isn't there. It's not just a case of scaling up, which I think it was for the genomes to some extent. A lot of the technology has still got to be developed, so it may well take longer. Um, the other problem, of course, is that although we've got lots of structures in the PDB, what this shows is that the number of unique structures at the bottom is actually quite small, or the number of uh, representative structures, shall we say, of given families. And so, but the, that's the bad news. The good news, of course, well, is that there actually aren't that many protein families. It's clear that there are of the order of a few thousand, probably at maximum, and that the huge variation that we see in biological function comes about by mixing and matching these domains together in some way. So that last year, most of the structures that were determined looked similar to one that had already been determined before. That's not to say that they don't have new information in. They clearly do. They might have a drug that's bound or something like that. But, it, but it, it's clearly that the, the sort of parts that we have to play with. And in fact, most of biological variation has come from, from individual proteins radiating out, radiating out and doing multiple functions rather than um, evolving whole new protein folds. And this is actually a plot taken from uh, one of John Malt's papers. Sorry, is that better? Yeah. Um, which suggests that you can pick, you can have a sort of a clever strategy for deciding which protein structures should be solved. And if one cleverly picks which ones you want to do, and not actually it's not that cleverly when it comes down to it, quite, quite straightforwardly, you, you can find that you only need to de determine about 10,000 structures to have reasonable models for most of the domains. I think the issue of how these domains all pack together is, is a different one, and I'm not sure that just by having the structures of the individual domains we'll be able to construct the whole thing. In fact, that's one of the challenges that I think, I think we face. So those are really the, that's the hard, what I think of as the hard data. Once we've got that, it is wonderfully finite which is very consoling, I find it very, very consoling anyway, that, that there is a limit to how much of that data there is. Um, but of course, from there, that's the beginning of everything, not the end. And hopefully, um, already we have a good taxonomy at the NCBI. And I think clearly by 2020, that taxonomy with all the new sequences will become really very stable and we'll be confident about that. Now, I might be wrong about that, but uh, I, I would hope so. It's also clear that we're going to build up our dictionary, if you like, of protein domain families. So we'll have um, on, the, on the sort of shelf a, a book or on, on the computer the equivalent that tells you all about all the individual domain families, what they do, what they look like, what their properties are, perhaps what they, um, who they interact with, which networks they're involved in. All of those sort of things we'll, we'll have Brought, brought together. So we'll have a much better view, I think, of the world of, of proteins and, and how they perform the biological functions that they've got to do. And from that, we can go on and do classifications that we've done already, but, um, and many other people as well. And, and we, that will become, I think, much more, at the moment, we're just looking at a slice and we're extrapolating to the future. I think we'll find out whether that slice was a good representative or not. Um, and as I say, the number of protein families that we can expect is really quite small. 
And so I think we will have these, these parts really determined. But gene expression, of course, is a completely different thing, and it's different for diff various reasons. One is that at the moment we're still getting the data and we don't have it. There, there isn't 30 years' experience behind us. But, of course, the other is that it isn't hard data in the sense that um, a sequence is hard data because it just depends on what the conditions are and the environment. And so, in a sense, the expression data is just infinite. And you get out this, these, sort of, uh, these sort of plots, and, and then you've really got to start all of the information processing. And so the next 20 years, I think, will see the collection of expression data. And again, this is still um, much more advanced, my uh, suspicion, well, I think there is a lot more data held, actually, in industry than there is in academia at the moment. There's a, there's a reasonable amount in academia, but it's not really put together. And there's been a real uh, goal to try to get together all the information that you need for a microarray experiment. And I think there's been international agreement on this in the, the Miami Convention to um, really to, to say what the data is that you want to hold and, and, and what some part of the ontology that we need to do that. And I think uh, at EBI, Alvis Brasmer is developing this Array Express, and there's also uh, similar developments here, I think. And so there are going to be databases. By 2020, I think we'll all have access, hopefully, to very large databases on different gene expression. And that, that will be just great, because from that, I think, we'll develop then the possibility of doing the mo modeling, the simulation, and the prediction. And I think, really, it's this area that is going to be the area of most intellectual challenge uh, computationally. I hope that by then we'll han have hands on the data, if you like. We we'll have sorted out how we store it, how we solve it, how we distribute it, how everybody accesses it in the way that they want to access it. But in terms of actually understanding, I think that's, that's going to require the development of whole new ways of doing modeling. And, um, the analogy, because one it's very strange, when one's asked to look forward to 2020, you immediately look back to 20 years ago and think where you were then and what's changed over the last 20 years. And of course, when I entered this field, the big goal was to solve the protein folding problem. You know, from sequence to structure, that was the, that was the paradigm that was really drove everybody. And really, we aren't very much closer towards that than we were 20 years ago. And I think it really does emphasize that basic understanding is very hard to get. <laughs> data by comparison is easier, but actually interpreting it is very difficult. And I think it's here that having good, robust models will make an enormous difference. And there are different sorts of modeling that you can do. So you can do molecular modeling, where you take one protein and another ligand, another protein, and how do you dot them together? So that's very much at the molecular level. But I think increasingly the interest will be in pathway modeling, process modeling, and modeling whole cells, organisms, and organs. And, of course, the wonderful thing about modeling is that you start with your data, you understand the data, and from that you can generate a hypothesis. From that you can build a model, and from that you can build a prediction. And that's what you want to do, to go along that route. And we're in this state now where there's just a flood of data. And so the next steps are going to be working towards the predictions. And to do this, I think we'll need, as, as we were talking about thieving from, uh, from related disciplines, I think there's absolutely no doubt that we will thieve and take what we can. And, and it's very powerful if you look in the engineering departments, their, their systems processing, the way that they handle their pathways. Is we, we were trying to do something on pathways. They have a um, linear programming algorithm that, that, that can find us all our pathway distances like that, whereas our algorithms took miles longer. So we can borrow all of these, I think, to inform us as to how we, we, we build our models. Um, so there are different sorts of networks that I think we're going to have. We're going to have the pathways, and of course we all think of the metabolic pathways, the linear or occasionally circular pathways. And we know that these aren't pathways, they're really very, very complex networks. And so we, don't, we can't just, in isolation, model pathways, we have to worry about the whole network. And we have to worry about it, not probably to include it all, but to know what we can, we can exclude, 
what, which bits we can effectively cross out when we're trying to model any one part of it. And that, I think, is going to be a challenge that many of the um, sort of processing packages will be able to handle. Um, we've also got the signaling pathways that we're only just beginning to uncover, and I think the next 20 years we'll see the uncovering of a lot of those. And with that will come the, the models and the modeling and hopefully the prediction. And of course, the big challenge is the, the, to include the, the time constraints as well, to try to see if you can actually model. So that we want not just, I think starting with qualitative models, in, eff in effect, all the models that many of you draw when you, you draw, you know, this interacts with this, interacts with this, those at the moment are not accessible computationally and they have to be made accessible. We have to develop uh, mechanisms. So we've been going through the same thing with, with enzymes. We know all about enzyme possible catalytic mechanisms. And the only way you can find them is to go and read the literature and draw these wretched diagrams with their arrows on. <laughs> and we have to find a way to capture that information computationally. Because if you're going to try, for example, to look at an enzyme active site and then predict what its catalytic mechanism is, then you need a way in the computer to do that because it's much more powerful if you can learn from the data that you've got. So I think that this developing of models is really going to be a challenge, a great challenge. Um, I think it's also important to point out that models at different levels have different uses. Um, sometimes you need very detailed information and sometimes you need very general information. So for me, the best analogy is that actually if you want to know how many miles you go, you can do, you can work out the miles per gallon quite easily for your car, knowing nothing about what's inside. And, and that's very useful. In a cell, you can have the same sort of very high level modeling. And I think we have to choose which, which level we want to model which process at. And, and it all depends what data we've got and what we know we can ignore. So it's the same, it was always in the same in, in astronomy and physics and, and atmospheric uh, climatology and everything. It, you, you, you choose your model according to your data and build out from there. Um, and of course, one of the, the great things about having the expression data is that potentially you can reverse engineer gene networks from microarray data, array data. And this is, again, a slide from Alvis Brasma where you can take the gene networks, you can get the expression levels from the microarray experiment, and from that you can hope to work out some sort of network. That network may mean different things. It may mean, as we've said already, A interacts with B or A inhibits B. We, we don't know what that means, but it's the beginning of ideas, hypothesis, it, that, that can sort of lead, lead us forward. And of course, this is, this is one of the networks that Alvis generated from the... Um, for, for, from the yeast, and you can see it's just horrible. And I think, <laughs> I think what we've obviously got to do is to develop all the tools that with this sort of an experiment, we'll put it into some biologically sensible, visually sensible, um, and predictive uh, tool that we can say, well, if we change this enzyme, or if we interfere, because of course that's what you want to do, you want to stop some enzymes in pathways, if we stop this one, what will it do to the whole network so that we get end up with something more like this and, and more sort of biologically linked? Um, actually, I th well, another, we, we've been very interested, I've not mentioned evolution yet, which is obviously a great challenge, and we have all these sequences, and we can really begin to address evolution. And one of the things we've looked at recently is pathway evolution. And we really don't have no concept, I don't think, really of how pathways have evolved. We've worried a lot and are still worrying about how enzymes evolve or proteins evolve and how they change their functions during evolution. But the next step is go to the pathways and the networks and ask how they've evolved and how they've changed between different organisms. Um, and so you can begin to address questions like this when you develop the tools, but at the moment, uh, we were looking at the um, ecocyc and E. coli. Actually, getting the information out is a nightmare for all the different things. So linking all the bits together from the sequences, from the pathways to the sequences to the structures. And that really brings up another issue that, that the integration of data is going to be, I, I won't go into this actually.
because it's too too long. So um, so that's that's I think where where a little view of where we might be in 2020. Just at, at the academic level, I haven't actually talked about the medical or the implications for uh, the links to the medicine, and I think that that is important. But I, I couldn't really tackle everything, and I wasn't sure what to say about that, and I don't know very much about it. Um, I think it is interesting to look at the uh, hardware and what we'll need computationally. And again, one thinks about uh, where we've come from during the last 20, 30 years, and, and one started with small machines, then people tend to have a big machine, but it was for the whole university, and you had one terminal and you used it. Uh, and then you had both the lab-based and the big, big supercomputers, super the craze. The last two or three years have seen the introduction of farms, and biology has really moved from the small compute to the vast compute. And most of, um, many of us have got, got quite reasonable-sized farms, and I think very quickly the biology, the, 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 the biotechnology industry will pull, that, that will be the main usage of compute, or a very, very main, it will compete with the astronomy and with the um, atmospheric and, and everything. We're going to see huge demand for, for large farms. But I think that that, in turn, will be replaced, hopefully, by a more sensible grid system. With, I don't know if you're familiar with the grid concept where you kind of, the best analogy is probably where you plug your plug in and you got it, get electricity, but you don't know whether it's coming from a nuclear power station or a coal power station, it's just centralized. And if one can develop that sort of a system whereby compute sy systems all over a country or for that matter the world, and you can access them, then I think that becomes very attractive. And I think it's being pushed by the physicists, by the particle physics community to handle their data from CERN. And so it will happen because they've got lots of money as far as I can see. <laughs> and, and, and I think that we will benefit enormously from that. But I think what we need is actually rather different because I think the critical thing for most of us is actually the data grid, not the, not, not the compute, well the compute grid probably is important, but the data grid is even more important. And it's the sharing of the data, these large, very large um, expression databases that we need to share across um, continent, you know, acro across cities and everything. We don't want to have to store them in every single place. And how that will emerge, I really don't know. But I'm sure that there will be progress towards this more sort of grid-based um, technology. The other thing that I think is important that perhaps we haven't spent, um, as, as bioinformatics people, haven't spent enough time on, is preparing the data and presenting it in a way that it's useful for the biologist, the wet bench biologist. This is absolutely critical, I think. And so people aren't going to want to, this data, you know, the data is just mushrooming, it's just vast. And any one person can only conceive a little fraction or understand a little fraction of that biology. But they want to see all the information that they need to look at their problem. And at the moment, that's still quite difficult. So, for example, if we take, you want to understand all about aging. What are the proteins that are thought to be involved in aging? What are the pathways that are thought to be involved in aging? What do you know about aging in the different model organisms? How do you tie it all together? That is just critical, I think. So these views of the data for the bench scientists, I think, are something that we've got to, to address. And, of course, um, I've taught the parts database that I've talked to, um, talked about, are really the, the, co the core data, if you like. But without the linkages out to these other databases that are listed here, then I think we, we just lose half of the value of the information that we've generated. And the literature is top of that list because I think it is the top priority. All the information about biology is in the literature. If we don't successfully mine that literature and get it into a computer-readable, transportable, you know, mineable form, then we'll, we'll, we'll lose things. And, and, and that's immensely powerful. I think that's where computers can re really help. The ontologies, getting the defined grammars 
is just critical for the bio biology and biological pro as we heard before you know this phosphor a phosphorylates b c sticks to d and interferes with so and so all the all those verbs if you like about what happens we need to define those those aren't really defined yet the disease information the mutation database the location where things happen the therapeutics and the compounds databases, I think, in terms of translating the genome into benefits for human health, are just critical. And so we have to link through to those databases. And ultimately, one of the real, I think, attractive uh, challenges is to try to understand toxicology and why, given a given drug, that interacts with certain other proteins, protein families. Is it specific? Is it non-specific? And we can only do that if we link this molecular pathway data through to the toxicology data. And that's really, I guess, also saying linking it through. The one that I missed off here, which I shouldn't have done, is the phenotypes, which is, is sort of saying it's, it's understanding the links between the genes and the phenotypes. And just one example, just trying to map the omin mutations onto protein structures at the moment is not a straightforward procedure. And that just has to be, and it's not just, once you mapped it, you need to know. So this just shows, say, in porphyrolinogen deaminase, these mutations call, uh, cause acute porphyria. And they occur in the active site of the enzyme. So you can understand what's going on. You need that information. In contrast, in uh, Wardenberg syndrome, it's a mutation to a DNA binding protein that occurs in the DNA binding site. So again, you can understand that. And lastly, the last one is thought to be because of mutations in an interface that break up the dimer. And so you get a deficiency in um, the, the antithrombin. So these, this sort of information, you need to, uh, it, in, a, in one sense, it's annotation. But in another sense, it's the thing that really captures the understanding about what's going on. And the other, as I mentioned before, I think that just linking from the DNA through to the proteins to the ligands in terms of linking the bioinformatics and the chemoinformatics. So I think what I'm really saying is that, you know, you think of the genome, and, but the genome is really at the core of everything. And from, from this, it's the links to the other disciplines, not, not just in data, it's the other disciplines, the people who've dealt with the small molecules for years, years and years. We want to tie that in so that we can look at a fat protein family. We can say these are the proteins that bind drugs. So if we look, for example, the human genome, at the moment, only there are only 155 drug proteins that are human out of the whole lot. That's 0.4% of the genome. There are probably about 3,000 close homologs, which may be drug druggable, and a few more distant homologs. Does that mean that they're the only ones that we can drug? Or does it mean that those represent the pathways? If we can find other proteins in that pathways, those are the ones that we want to go for. So you can see for this, in order to do this sort of work, you need the whole lot lined up all together so that you can go in and extract that information straight away. Okay, so what are the grand challenges? I think there is a huge challenge to develop the biological ontologies. And this is one of those challenges that's right at the interface of computer science and biology. A computer scientist can't do it at all because they don't understand the biology. A biologist who doesn't understand the need for ontologists and what the restrictions are can't do it. So actually people who are at this very interface are critical for doing that. And I think the Go ontology is a beautiful example of that. This developing qualitative and quantitative models, I think, has to be a grand challenge. I'll come back now to my roots. <laughs> the, if we could calculate free energy, then we could solve many, many problems. We could, we could solve the protein folding problem. We could solve protein ligand interactions. We could solve protein-protein interactions. We wouldn't need to go and do all the experiments. If only we could calculate free energy. Now, I think this is a huge challenge. It's not, and I suspect it's not one that's going to be solved by biologists, but it would really revolutionize our whole and our understanding of biology. Obviously, we want to predict interaction networks to save everybody having to go and do it by, by experiment. And we want to predict the effect of 
drug therapy as a, as a generic thing when you're trying to develop drugs, but also for individuals so that you can give them diagnoses. And perhaps the, maybe the biggest challenge, I think, in the long term is to design new molecules, to take what we've learned from biology and to put it to our advantage by designing whole new things that do things that we want them to do with specific functions. So, um, and, of course, to understand how we got here in the first place. <coughs> so um, I'm rambling on a bit, I'm afraid, but the immediate challenges then, if we're going to get to this brave new world where we can model everything and predict everything and, uh, you know, like life we understand much more than we did before, we really have to get the foundations right. We've got to get the databases sorted out. And this just shows, in fact, this is a list taken from Rolf Atweiler from the Swiss Prot, but the things that he wanted to do in the immediate future. To the database for Swiss Prot should be complete and up to date with minimal redundancy. That sound, the, the minimal redundancy sounds trivial, but anybody that's used these databases knows that it's a pain and it's really got to be sorted out. You want the, as much annotation as you can get. You want it all to be retrievable by programs. And you want this high interoperability with, a, with other databases. So if we just look at the protein database, the structural database, it's actually, it started in 1973. So it's almost 30 years old. And many of its, it's, it's been immensely useful to the world, to everybody. I mean, my life has been built on the PDB practically, so, uh, academically. But, but it's basically a flat file format. It's got almost no annotation. So after people have spent years and years determining structures, you don't even know which are the active site residues if you look at a PDB file. The deposition still involves hand curation. The ontologies aren't complete. There's almost no ontologies for the NMR part of it. Um, in terms of actually using it to predict structure from sequence or to predict function from sequence, the, there's almost um, nothing, you know, actually we've, we've really not made big progress there. So just the basics, some of the basics really still have to be addressed. The annotation, as far as Rolf Artnail is concerned, is very much uh, the bottleneck, providing the annotation. And so for proteins, we want functions, post-translational modifications, domains, sites, protein-protein interactions, pathways, diseases, sequence conflicts, variants, all of that. And some of that, well, most of that is in the literature and not, not in a computer-readable form. So that, that is a huge challenge. For the genome annotation with Ensemble, clearly that's immensely powerful. We, you know, you and sitting in the audience has brought with, with many other people at EBI and at the Sangha, they've brought together all of this information. But what's important, I think, and this is something that was developed uh, with many people around the world, I think, is the idea of distribution to annotation, where people who are experts can provide their own annotation. And I think the DAS system is one example of how that might be provided, but I do think it's going to be increasingly important in some way to allow the community to contribute to these databases. Um, so that really reviews, obviously, wh where, where one can get annotation from. The ontologies, those are the areas where the real uh, need is. So diseases, when we started looking at the OMIM diseases, you get these syndromes and you've no idea what they are, and you just don't know <laughs> where to look. And it's really difficult for people who are you know, trained as a physicist, and then you have to try and understand what these medical conditions are. And so you really need some, <laughs> some, some sort of short, sharp summary that, that will tell you, that can also link them back to the med. And I guess for the medics, they want it in reverse. They want to understand what the hell this complicated protein structure looks like and why this mutation should cause this particular effect. So we've got to uh, build that in. The ontologies I, I've talked about a little bit. Um, okay, so the priorities, for, oh, priority, no, I've spelled that right. Um, the, I, I put this up because, um, well, Tony Blair, our prime minister, when he was uh, campaigning for his election, he said, we have three priorities. The first is education, the second is education, and the third is education. 
As far as I'm concerned, for databases, the first is data integration, the second is data integration, and the third is data integration. It really is a challenge for us, and I think we ought to address it. And so, within the EBI, clearly, we, we have a mission to bring the data together. And again, there are many different technical solutions, and it's not clear to me which is the correct one to go down. But I think we have to think in these ways um, now, not in five years' time. So, then, just to summarise, um, I guess the literature curation, I would probably still put top of my list. The standardised vocabularies, the ontologies, the interoperabilities, and having within the database some quality assessment as to um, what, what we need. And biologically, there are just, you know, I started doing this and I could have gone on all night. Um, you know, there are so many different biological challenges that we can really address, and they're going to need new algorithms and new approaches. And I think the close integration between the computational and the experimental is what we need. And just to underline that, I'd just like to point out the composition of my group. I have three biochemists, three biologists, four, three physicists, four chemists, one computer scientist, and one mathematician. And I think that will become the norm rather than the exception, actually. And what I do feel is that the, the, the physic, so I, I've had quite a lot of people who've converted from high energy physics or whatever come to the group. And it really does take, it's, it's certainly not a day's work, it's a year before they begin to talk the same language. And it's another six months before they really get their teeth into a project. It takes a lot of time, I think, but it is immensely rewarding. And I think that they, these are the people who have the skills in the other fields who come together and work together with the biologists. I think together we will go forward. And I think that's, oh, I just got a, uh, acknowledgements to people who've helped me when I've been struggling with what to say and provided me with some slides. Thank you. I'm sure there are questions, and I want to suggest that people who want to ask questions, please come to the standing mics. The people in the back of the room have not been able to hear the questions, so please speak up and say your name and your affiliation before your question, because some of us don't know everybody here. We'll start in front. Um, I enjoyed your talk very much, and uh, I just... David, <laughs> who are you? <laughs> <laughs> David Valley from uh, Hopkins. So, in the, I, but I couldn't help uh, adding another kind of prediction that we would like to make to your list of predictions. And that is that as we learn more about uh, the contribution of various genes to susceptibilities and resistances to phenotypes, the physician will be faced with dealing with an individual patient yeah, who has all these individual strengths and absolutely. weaknesses and a unique environmental history. And then the physician and the patient will say, what how now? do I deal with yeah. this? And yeah. what, what yeah. do I, yeah. what's best for this particular yeah. patient at this particular time? And at least right now, I mean, it's hard to deal with the serum sodium sometimes. And so yeah. dealing with that kind of information <laughs> is mind bending. So we need I, work in that area. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think um, what I have, you will notice in my group, I don't have a clinician. That's because I can't pay them enough, I think. <laughs> but, but I actually think that, uh, you know, there should be and will be uh, clinicians. And I think, but I think it will be another branch. I think the health, the whole health issue, uh, you know, how to keep patient records, all of that issue, and then how to link that up is, is a huge thing. And I don't know how far we, we will be down that line by 2020. I think it's going to be quite difficult. Next question. Pavel Piavsner, UCSD. I enjoy your talk and I agree that data integration and databases are extremely important. However, it has been already said in 1998 when we, uh, people prepared this report, and actually 90% of bioinformatics part of this 1998 report is about databases and data integration. What is missing in this report is was that if we wanted to assemble the human genome, we needed to have new algorithmic ideas. For example, we needed to have new fragment assembly. And what is mi was missing in this report is that this fragment assembler back in 1998 did not exist. 
So I wonder what do you think are major algorithmic challenges in bioinformatics these days, computational challenges. And by computational challenges, I mean not like if we say to predict uh, interaction networks. It's not yet computational challenge for me. It's a biological problem. How does it translate in mathematical challenges? Do we need to develop new mathematics? Well, probably we are okay with existing mathematics and should just refine existing methods. So what do you think? What are the grand bottlenecks algorithmically and mathematically in this area? I think this is a very, very difficult question and it's one that actually is a very common question from engineers and mathematicians who say, give us the problem and we'll give you the solution. And actually, I honestly can't I, I think there are time issues in terms of we've got huge databases and we're trying to bring them all, the data resources into families and clustering isn't fast enough and we need to proceed that clustering. But that's, there are clustering algorithms out there already and it's really just a case of implementing them efficiently, I suspect. So I can't put my finger on a new algorithm that I think we, we should need. We need... Stats is often very important when you're looking at matches and, you know, really the, the BLAST and the CYBLAST, their, their power rests in their statistics and treating that properly. And that's, in a sense, it's not a new algorithm. It's just a new way of assessing the matches and then going, going round. And that, those, those two algorithms, are pro, or those two programs, have probably had more effect on the field of protein, certainly, than, than any other. So I'm not sure how often we actually need new algorithms. So I can't really help you, I'm afraid. <laughs> I had a question about... Can you say your name, please? Uh, 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 Giulio Licinio from UCLA. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation, and I had a question about uh, phenotypic data. Do you think that uh, the database of the future will have that? And let's say by to. the year 2020, could we have like a person's entire DNA sequence plus the person's entire phenotype in a database that you could then try to model? I think that raises all sorts of um, LC. I think you call them issues. <laughs> <laughs> but l um, let's say if the individual is willing to, um, to, 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 to do that, and if the, all the I think it's LC easier to start with mice and E. coli addressed. and things like that. <laughs> um, and I, I think that, uh, yes, we have to have phenotypes. There's absolutely no doubt at all. And, and really, uh, I don't know whether I got it in. It was one of, you know, the genotype to phenotype, that, that you know, moving from one to the other is, is the key issue. And we can't do that in any sort of high throughput way unless we have the phenotypes held um, in, in the database. And also then how you, if you think about Drosophila, which has lots of phenotypes, how do you map those onto, I didn't actually, I meant to talk a little bit about comparative genomics, I completely forgot. How do you map from Drosophila onto mouse, onto C. elegans, onto human. I think linking those phenotypes together um, will be easier at the molecular level than it will be at the description level, I suspect. But I, I really haven't thought very much about phenotype ontologies. Yes. One thing from the uh, ethical point of view, I think we um, see a big barrier to that, and we think about the average person, but there are many people that... Um, I've talked to, let's say, the elderly people who have terminal illnesses, etc., who would be more than willing to donate their DNA and their history if that it's not they're not going to be, you know, around much longer. So they are very. I mean, people seriously, they are, yeah. they are willing to do that. You know, people donate, you know, their body to science or make sure. organ donations. You can also donate your DNA. Yeah. So it's not um, out of the question or completely, you know, implausible. I, I think it's critical that we we do have these things, and I think many of the. Um, you know, like all the sub sub pair studies, it's clear that those are going to have to be completely international because you often don't have enough data in one country or one continent. And so bringing all of that together, I think, is going to be crucial. But how much will be done by 2020, I don't really know. A lot, actually, I think, in uh, the, the map. Uh, Oliver Smith is University of North Carolina. Uh, Janet, I, I like very much your comment on uh, literature. Um, I just want to make a little parallel there that the, uh, we had at one time, we, we just had the Index Medicus and that was titles and then we had uh, yeah. Medline and yeah. then that was abstract. Yeah. 
and now we have often enough for the ability to get to the uh, whole paper. And that sequence is absolutely essential in order to uh, uh, evaluate the worthwhileness of most of the data because often enough the title claims things that even the abstract doesn't <laughs> say and the data are Certainly hopeless. Don't prove. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and you have to be able to have that uh, chain. Check. So I would uh, urge very much the uh, uh, p proselytization, if you like, of the idea that all of the data must be a computer available in the original form yeah. rapidly. But a much better search algorithm is needed because you can have a search algorithm for words that you know are in there and t uh, authors that you know are there and it will miss completely. And uh, that's really... Uh, Un I think it's a, a real challenge. I know um, a group in Sheffield that does a lot of uh, word processing and word, you know, literature mining. They try to do it on enzyme active sites, which biologically are actually rather well determined compared with most of the data that many of you deal with. And so all they were trying to do was to extract which are the catalytic residues. And I don't think they were. It, I don't think it worked because there are so many different ways of saying, you know, this is a nucleophile or this might be, but it's not because of so and so. That it's very difficult to mine. But I think we have to do something. But I think hand annotation and hand curation, as we all know, the reason Swiss prot is so valuable is because of the army of annotators that have, have worked on it for so many years. My name is Arend Sido from Stanford University. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, one thing that um, is often peripherally mentioned, and in fact, you just said, oh, I forgot to talk about it. Um, <laughs> it's comparative genomics oh. and related uh, things in molecular evolution. And I just wanted to emphasize that I think comparative genomics has a much more important role to play in the future than what we con currently consider it uh, to be useful for. Um, so, for example, right now uh, we think that you know, inferring functional regions in the genome is important, those, those kinds of things. I, I think we have a much bigger issue in that we have chosen to work on many, many model organisms. And it's really going to be inc incredibly important to integrate the information from the, dis from the disparate organisms we work on um, in a rational framework um, so that we can actually make predictions as to you know, uh, what our human health status is going to be and those kinds of things. Um, so I wanted to emphasize that that is, that is actually a very difficult problem that goes beyond just where we come from and the sort of short-sighted utility that we see in it currently, but I think that it is a, a fundamental framework that needs to be established I, in the future. I couldn't agree more, and, and it, I really seriously did forget, because I was going to do another, another slide that I just forgot to, to, to include, um, because I, th I think this ability, so again coming back to aging, um, I'm, we, we're just starting a project that's looking at aging in Drosophila, C. elegans, mouse, and hopefully wanting to extrapolate to humans. And so there's going to be transcriptome data, mutants. You know, how, how do you make your, your mouse models for a particular disease? It's all related into this comparative genomics and how you can go across. Um, so. I, I think how that is handled is going to be very, very important because much of what we know comes from many different organisms and so actually synthesizing it into, a, I know many organisms are different, so different things and the problem for example with the KEG database which is a, um, for those people who don't know, it's a pathway database, is that they synthesize, they put all of the organisms in together and create the pathway and then you can extract which bits come from E. coli uh, but in fact it does obfuscate so it makes it more complicated when you're trying to use it so I think we have to find really powerful ways of linking the, the, the different genomes together I think it's critical. Ken? Uh, Kurt Fishbeck from the NIH. Uh, you mentioned linking bioinformatics and chemoinformatics, and I would wonder if you could say something about the prospects of having something useful to link up to in terms of uh, small molecule chemoinformatics. Um, it's my understanding that the, the large uh, pharmaceutical companies have ways of, uh, you know, describing their their chemical libraries and uh, distributing them in chemical space and annotating them. Right. Uh, but is That's there a prospect for having a, a, a shared resource that would make uh, that kind of information available, overcoming the proprietary barriers. Uh, you mentioned you have four chemists on staff, and I was wondering if 
if you have any thoughts about how that could be done uh, um, scientifically as well as socially. I, I think scientifically it's quite straightforward, actually, in the sense that, that many of the chemists within pharma have developed wonderful algorithms for doing very fast searches on small databases. The problem is that they've got all the data, and especially all the toxicology data, actually, um, that, that they sort of don't use in the way that perhaps academically one would like to use it. And I think that this is a really good area for academic industry interaction, actually. Um, I, and I think there's a whole, I mean, it's a really interesting problem to sort of map protein space with metabolome space, with drug space, um, and, and put, it, put it all together. And so I think there are lots of challenges. So we've been, academically, we've been looking at some, some of these things. So how, how, how do, you know, how do proteins distinguish guanine from adenine? I mean, it's, it's, so there are all sorts of negative things that must be in biology because the metabolome, not in plants, but in humans, is, is smallish. I mean, it's, again, it's finite and it's not that large. And so actually understanding how the interplay of these small and large molecules, I think, is critical. And I think we must find a way to work with the pharma companies to, to develop this because from this could come all sorts of... Um, you know, really, I think, incredible. You know, the major problem with drug design, as everybody knows, isn't isn't actually designing the lead. It's getting it to go in the body and you know not be toxic and, and all of those sorts of things. And at the moment, it's very hit and miss. So the drug companies have a huge. Um, if, if one could say, this is not a druggable protein, or this is not going to work in in humans because it will interact with all these other protein molecules, then that would would cut down their costs enormously. So I think it would be hugely to their advantage and hugely to the academic understanding as well. So I, I hope that happens. So one of the things I'm trying to do at the EBI is to get some chemoinformatics brought in and to interact with people. Hi, Mike Eisen from Berkeley. Um, so with the literature, you've touched on something near and dear to my heart. Um, Sorry, I shouldn't stand in the microphone. So I have a question and a, and a statement. So the question is, how do you, I mean, do you see a path for us to go back to the hundreds of thousands of articles that have previously been published? PhD that are, students. <laughs> well, so, I mean, it's a, I mean I, there's obviously a lot of parts to it. There's the getting it into digital form and then getting it annotated. But I, and, and so I just want to know if there's any ideas for how to get into that literature and, and make it accessible. And then the, the statement is just I want to point out that m most of the literature we're publishing now today is being produced in, a, in this machine readable form that, that we could be using and we, we, we could be using to annotate the genome, we could be using it to do all sorts of things, but we're all, or almost all of us, signing away the, the rights to use this in such a fashion in the, by the way we publish. And I'd just like to encourage people to, to, who, who appreciate the value that, that the literature could have for for doing all these things we want to do in the future, to, to try to stop and to change the way in which we do that so that all the literature can be available. Mm -hmm. But also, I, I really do want to know if people have ideas for, especially the EBI or the places, for how do you go backwards in time as opposed to forward in time, I think, is easy if we all act properly. But going backwards in time is a much more difficult um, problem. I, and yeah, I think, actually, we should look forwards. And the key thing to looking forwards is to develop the ontologies. Because if we have the ontologies, then we should be able to get, um, in some way, uh, be able to abstract from, from the literature in the future. As far as going backwards goes, so we, we've been doing a study of enzyme catalysis. And I've had six students, summer students, over the last three years, plowing through the literature to try and get the information out. And it is the only way. And after they'd done it, a new PhD student started and had to go through all the literature again to make sure it's all consistent. I mean, it is a nightmare. It is a nightmare. But if you're interested in the data, it's the only way to look at it. It's the only way to get there. And so from that, what I hope is that we'll develop the ontology and we'll develop the models that will allow people to represent their, whatever their enzyme is, as this active site is like this. And they'll draw the little arrow diagrams, but they'll also submit, hopefully, a, a computational version of that to a database that we might set up on Enzyme. Because I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, one has to start somewhere. I mean, I guess P Pavel was looking for, for challenges, for algorithmic challenges. It seems to me that there's oh. an algorithmic challenge of, of trying to 
automate but, that process so that you don't have to have a million PhD students read but all there, the... But there is a huge amount of work already in text mining in, I think, in the military and all sorts of places. Um, but I don't think it's... I, I don't know, it should be easier for scientific literature, but um, the, as I say, I'm only familiar with this one project, and they had a lot of trouble, I know, in what I thought was a relatively straightforward task. Can the I, middle, actually, I think the middle might, mic is next, and then you... Other people might have a better answer to that. I don't know if there's anybody, any of you lot know about text mining? Because there is a lot of text mining out there. No? kind of difficult yet. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, uh, statement, then a comment. A statement about the last thing is a distributed... State your name, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Douglas Crawford from the University of Missouri. Uh, a distributed effort. There are lots of people who have knowledge on their enzyme, their kinetics. Absolutely. If they would just enter the like database it. some yeah. way, but yeah. you have to somehow reward them for that as a publication. I don't know how you would remove it, but there are lots of people that, that would just, might just be able to do that. That's not my question. That's just... <laughs> I've uh, thought back to, about that. It's, yeah. it's back to comparative genomics and in annotations, the surprising thing that we find is how difficult it is to do the annotation even when you try your best. So we work on a fish. Um, and so if we want to be able to link all our cDNAs up to keg, it's impossible. And, for example, simple enzymes that we know well on TCA pathways aren't named as a simple yeah. enzyme pathways. No, Succinyl dehydrogenase has got uh, right, three different molecules. Right. And so you come up with a protein which isn't succinyl dehydrogenase. It's yeah. something else. And that simple tool would go far from comparative genomics, a way to easily mark my gene into either the yeast pathway or into the keg database. That's not a difficult task, yet yeah. nobody yeah. seems to be doing it. That's yeah. a simple tool. I want to know, yeah. in protein X, where is it in yeast, where is it in keg? Yeah, I, I absolutely. I think uh, we certainly went through the same process with our structural data on annotating keg, and, and we actually had a, you know, sort of a very good computing person, and they basically hacked something so that they could annotate the pathways with all of our structures, but it was a hack. Um, so I think that many of the, what, one of the reasons I went back to the PDB and the basic, I think many of the things that we need are actually fairly straightforward and fairly simple. The problem is applying them over whole databases is rarely straightforward and never simple. I mean, it's, it's hard. We have time for one more, Rick. Rick Young, Whitehead Institute. With, with this discussion about data integration, um, I get, I get the sense that people are not aware that the vast majority of what you describe as challenges have been solved in yeast, that, that one of the most powerful sets of tools we have for education and research are two databases called Yeast Proteome Database and the Stanford Genome Database, and um, they're fully annotated. We can, for every gene, there's a thing, there's literature and connections over the internet to all that information. Yeah, yeah. It's just an extraordinary resource. And, and as a model, it might be used to create one for other organisms, and its deficiencies might be corrected by looking at that model and asking uh, what could be improved. Yeah. No, I, I know YPD is very powerful, but I thought, um, you, perhaps you could correct me, but certainly when we've accessed it, we can't dump it down. So we can't have access to the whole lot. It's just one thing at a time. And, and that really causes problems when you're trying to do it over the whole database. YPD, which is the most powerful of these, is, uh, was developed by a company and it is yeah. really accessible to academics, but is not fully downloadable. Yeah, well, the, the, and, and that actually, I mean, this is a real problem um, because that's just what you want and you don't want to go and repeat all of that. But at the same time, you need you really need, when you're trying to do build up protein families, you need views that cut across, so they go all the way across. Now, maybe we'll have to try and find clever computational ways that actually pull the data out for, you know, a particular query. But if you're trying to build integrated resources, it's very difficult when you can only do it a gene at a time. It but really is. Identify one limitation of that model and just 
just saying, it's such an extraordinary resource for yeast. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I agree. Because it was mainly hand annotated, is my understanding. And that YPD know, was all... And the human genome may well need to be the same. But, but these, the, these will be the same, you and assured me. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's, it's a real challenge, actually, and it's, again, one of these, these interfaces that, that we need to perhaps resolve. Thank you, Janet, for a very provocative talk and good answers to questions. It's now time for lunch.